You're listening to ShipFam. On today's episode, Luke and I discuss Extreme Go Horse and the differences between new engineers and experienced engineers and why they often follow the same seemingly bad practices. Please follow us wherever you get your podcasts and tweet at us at KCC Rogers or at Luke underscore Pighetti. Casey and I ran into a video of the Primogen who I, I love his content. I love his attitude. He's a lot of fun. And he had a he had a, some content about Extreme Go Horse, which Casey, can you lead us into what that is exactly? Yeah, yeah. So we'll link to the video in the show notes. You guys ought to watch the the video. It's pretty hilarious. He kind of discovers Extreme Go Horse as he's going. You can follow his whole thought process. Uh, he's reading this Medium article, which we'll also link, and it just starts sprinkling in little references to Extreme Go Horse. And every time he's like, "Wait, what is this?" Like, what the heck is Extreme Go Horse? Then finally, at the end of the article, the author says, I realize Extreme Go Horse is more of just like a Brazilian developer thing. So I've done my best to translate it. And it's presented as a meme, but it's also just like half good advice. Yeah. It's it's more than half good advice. It's like... 75% 75% good advice. I was going to say 75. And I mean, Luke, you have your own do, uh, do everything wrong. Do everything wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which so I, I realize extreme... now is exactly what Extreme Go Horse is. Like Extreme Go Horse is, is a better name than do everything wrong. So so let's just run through the tenets of Extreme Go Horse here. The first one is, I think, therefore, it's not Extreme Go Horse. So to rephrase that, it's like, if you're thinking, you're doing something wrong. And and yeah, I think and there's it, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. The whole thing is kind of listed as a joke and willfully made out like bad advice. I think each one is taking something that can often be a really good idea and then just as a gag listing it as bad advice, like flow state. It is it is a lot like flow state, but it's interesting yep. because the I think therefore it's not extreme go horse is interesting to me because so many times I've sat down to do system design. And I'll sit down, I'll do like an hour to two hours of system design. And then I go to implement the thing. And I just realized I would have been way better off just implementing it in code and just like doing it just in time. And I think this is picking away at the concept of doing things like too much thinking before actual coding, which is a very real thing. Yeah, I tend to do both. And of course, since this is listed as a written as a meme, It's kind of downplaying the value of the idea, but also being pretty extreme and axiomatic. I find it really helpful to just start belting out a prototype with the pitfalls I'm going to run into kind of back of mind. Yeah. And then I start figuring out better and better exactly how this has to work. And sometimes it just slowly navigates me to the right spot. More likely, if it's a really sticky problem, I'm going to be doing a fair amount of rewriting. I think that's the big problem is people are so afraid of rewriting. Just belt it out, which to be fair, Extreme Go Horse is anti-rewriting. We'll get that yeah, to that Yeah, and I am later. actually anti-rewriting too, and we can get to that when we get there. Well, well, let me let me clarify. I would say rewriting before you commit. Oh, it's, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's I rewriting, think after, com- rewriting before you commit is different than rewriting after you commit. Exactly. For sure. Yeah, that's a big And I think Extreme difference. Go Horse might agree with me that they more mean if you've committed it and it's functioning, don't touch it. Forget about it. Sure. One yeah. thing I would say is an alternative to doing like full-blown system design is I'll sit down and I'll write out just the requirements and I'll basically just put like a check mark next to everything that I'm very confident that I can just belt out right from the keyboard. And then if there's something that needs a little a uh, little more thought, then I might write some bullet points to try to break it down a little bit further. But I don't think that you need to go into like the whole thing of doing UGC diagrams, not UGC diagrams, what are those things called? UDM, are they UDM diagrams? Oh God, yeah. yeah. Yeah, anytime somebody starts using buzzwords or acronyms, my brain just kind of shuts off. Yeah. It's like UML, UML, UML diagram. Yeah, yeah. Oh God, that's one of my brain shut off switches is UML, Agile, etc. All these just like make me die a little inside when I hear them. And it's not that there's not reasonable things embedded in those ideas. It's more just that when you're a more senior engineer, I think those ideas just become baked into your intuition and they become loose rules of thumb and intuitions as opposed to rules that need some dogmatic name and a giant manifesto 
which really I think is usually just a, a strategy to sell consultancy fees more than is actually a sincere attempt to make good code. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do number two. Uh, number two, there are three ways of solving a problem. There's the right way, the wrong way, and the extreme go horse way, which is exactly like the wrong one, but faster. <laughs> extreme go horse is faster than any development process you know. <laughs> that so this is great. funny because this actually resonates with me because there's obviously like the right way, and we might describe that as the way that people talk about most often online. So like you should have test coverage, like full test coverage. You should be using clean code principles, blah, blah, blah. That you might describe as the quote unquote right way. And then there's the wrong way, which is like the newbie just casting something out into the darkness and hoping that it works. But then there's always this third way, which is kind of in between. And that's what I mm -hmm. always refer to when I say do everything wrong, where it's like, just be comfortable doing things that other people think are wrong if you have like a good reason to do it or if you have like enough experience to realize that it's going to net out positive. Yep. Yeah, like the one I know we both are into is just using static globals oh, to yeah. hold app state. Yeah. It's like, yeah, there's some pitfalls there. I like I'm writing some integration tests for a few different reasons in my app and it becomes a little bit painful to wrestle the static globals. But emphasis on a little bit, I'm aware of that downside that's a little tricky to manage dependency injection, ensure that one instance of the test isn't conflicting with another instance of the test, etc., but it's totally solvable. And if I really, really, really need to do something like integration tests in parallel, where a static global is fundamentally incompatible, cool, I just turn my static globals into a static global dictionary. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then, or a VAR and now the dictionary with, with visible for, for testing or something like that. Yeah, which is basically all RiverPod and a lot of these other frameworks are doing when they say, we're not static globals. <laughs> right, it's, it's they, literally just like a static map behind the scenes. Exactly, so it's like, I don't like having to build up all this stuff to pretend it's not a static global when I can just belt out a static global myself. Of course, I don't want to hate on Riverpod, et cetera, here too hard, because if you're just trying to get an individual app done, you don't have a bunch of familiarity in the space, and you just need to get moving, then fair enough, I get it. I think once you get more experienced, it often becomes desirable to reach for the dead simple thing you know you can home roll in five minutes yeah. rather than wrestle with a complicated sub-framework. And my big thing is like, if you've got a, if you've got a expensive solution and like a simple solution that seems like a bad idea, if you can't express why you should use like the quote unquote right version between those two, then there's probably not a good reason for you to be doing it. That's been my experience anyway. And maybe that gets more true, like as you get further in your career, but that's just something that I've noticed. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing we should caveat all of this with. And honestly, I should try to caveat my Twitter uh, coding hot takes with a little more. Is I think that the experience of an experienced dev writing code is fundamentally different than the newbie. Because we aren't actively thinking a lot of the times. It's flow state. We're right. just writing. But baked into that is all this formal intuition and scars and trauma from experience from yeah away. like like we know what we can get away with exactly and i think that's why you see that like the midwit bell curve meme yep where you have like the imbecile at the beginning who's using static globals but then maybe they end up shooting themselves in the foot right so then yep. they go into the middle and they do all of the crazy dependency injection systems and then they finally realize it's just a static global map and if they just don't do anything stupid, then they'll be fine using statics. And then you end up at the Jedi, which is exactly. like, for this particular topic, that's where I feel like I am. Yep. Yep. Let's jump through these. We do have a lot of them. So I think we may want to skip a few here. Uh, and honestly, some of them are just kind of jokes that are rewording the previous ones. But let's, let's jump do to four. the ones that seem... Four is good. Yeah. Extreme Go Horse is completely reactive. It's saying that errors only exist when you notice them. This one, I mean, of course, it's written like a joke. I think this one is a one I agree with a little less, but in all these things, it's going to be a balance. I have saved myself a lot of pain by realizing, hey, this part of the code base is really, really, really sticky. And here's a specific error that I think is very likely to happen. I'm going to proactively write to guard myself against that error. I think once again, though, the key secret is I have enough experience to know 
when that error really is going to bite me and to make a really quick trade-off estimation in my head and how worth combating that error is. And so it is important to protect against the newbie mistake. Uh, my favorite story is this guy had an intern who just started, and he told the intern, all right, this was at Firebase, by the way. He told the intern, I need, and I forget exactly what it was, but it was something along the lines of, I need to be able to check the time and have a timer. I want you to go figure out how to do that. And the guy forgot about the poor intern for like two weeks because he was busy with his own work. And he's like, oh, crap, I gave that intern like one day worth of work. What happened? I haven't heard from him. And he, the intern comes back to him and has this huge presentation about how he's like deep researched times and oh, dates. No. He's accounted for daylight savings time. He's even accounted for the fact that daylight savings time within the same supposed time zone will actually be different because it gets so long-winded and confusing. He was counting for leap years, leap seconds, blah, 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 blah. And the intern was about to rip his hair out and spent two weeks on this problem. And the poor senior dev was like, look, sorry, dude, this is my fault because I didn't coach you enough. But like, there's just a package in the Google Mono repo that I expected you to use. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I ran into this when I first started working at Tonal. And when I first started working at Tonal, I was all in on test-driven development and trying to think through every single possible test case ahead of time. And then what I would do is I would ship it and I would assume that since I had gone through all that process, that rigorous engineering process, that the quality on the other side was going to be good enough that I didn't really have to follow up on it. What I found out very quickly is that's just not true, right? So I had been engineering things and then not being reactive when it would have been what I found out later is it's better to under engineer things, but then be very reactive and be able to do fast follows on code that might not be working stuff that QA finds that you never in a million years would have been able to predict. So this yeah. one extreme go horse is completely reactive. It like resonates with me a lot. Yeah. Though to, to step back to, I think with every single one of these, it's, going to be different advice depending on what stage you are in your career. Like when I started at Google, I was a new grad and I was launching a new API feature for the Firebase real-time databases REST API. And I had everything working. I had even written my unit tests. Actually, they were really integration tests. And I had sandboxed it a ton. But every time I had only ever used curl to test this REST API. And then a more senior dev was like, hey, have you like check this with the Python admin client. It's using REST under the hood. And we were about like a day from launch. And this is Google too. So Google honestly should have put better guardrails than a senior dev just asking me. I went and tested it, immediately started breaking. I panic pulled the commit. And it just turned out that I wasn't quite compliant with the HTTP spec in a way that curl didn't care, but most other REST clients did care. So same kind of thing, like that's somewhere where a more senior dev was immediately like, hey, did you just like kick the tires here with our REST client? I was like, oh, no. Yeah. I think be reactive, not proactive, assumes that you're a senior dev that actually is doing a bunch of reactive stuff, but it's just so second nature that you don't even think about it. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, number five, an extreme horse, anything goes. Does it solve the problem? Did it compile? You commit it and don't think about it anymore. <laughs> I love this. Yep. I'm a big fan of the compiler should be your integration and unit tests. I mean, of course, there's only so far that can get you, but there's a lot of language features when you use them well, they act almost like a test for you. Like one of my favorites is exhaustive switch cases. So basically a switch without a default case. Default's such a foot gun. Please don't use default, unless you're doing everything wrong, in which case it's fine. But <laughs> <laughs> but I love a switch statement that's used properly. Uh, Firebase is, I keep coming back to Firebase because it's my best like production engineering frame of reference. It was using Scala, which was honestly a really cool language. And we use switch cases with sealed classes so extensively. And I remember there's this beautiful moment where I had to add a new message type to its internal messaging system. And I was like, oh, God, this is going to be a brutal refactor because it touches everything in this really, really deep layer of the stack. And I just created the class, extended the superclass, the sealed superclass, and bam, like 
70 to 100 static analysis errors. I went through those static analysis errors and then just did the obvious thing to fix it every time. It was pretty much always, hey, this switch is missing a new case. And then everything compiled and the code worked perfectly. I think I had to do like one or two tweaks before deploying it. But it's just such a beautiful feeling when your compiler's static and analysis errors are both your to-do lists and your tests. This one also resonates with me too, because this essentially is the anti-over-engineering is the way I see this. Yeah. Um, there, when you go in to work on a problem, you should have a sense of what the criteria actually are. And very rarely does a criteria have anything to do with the actual implementation. So what I've found is that the more senior I get, the more I look at the problem, look at the requirements, go in, do like a minimal diff, and then send it to code review and ship it. And that's not the way I used to work. The way I used to work is I used to try to do like, if I noticed something in the code that didn't feel quite right, I would try to do a refactor and try to get that landed at the same time, try to do some other cleanup. And it's yeah. just like, you just don't do that. You just get in, do the minimal diff, ship it. If you see something that you feel like needs to be refactored, you just make a ticket for that and come back. Yeah, I've done refactors along with feature shipping way too often, even still recently, like with my current indie app, almost every single one of our nasty bugs was I was working on a new feature that would be a lot easier if I did a refactor. So I did the refactor and the feature in the same commit. And then I launched it out. And that's just too much changing at once. Mm -hmm. Ends up being super hard to follow. And almost every time, if I had a really bad bug, that's why. All right, you want to do number seven? Yeah, yeah. Extreme Cohorse doesn't have schedules. Schedules are given to you by your clients are all but important. You will always be able to implement everything in time, even if that means accessing the database through some crazy script. <laughs> so I actually so, like this a lot because in engineering, and I've even said this to people before, and I think sometimes it's cope and sometimes it's not, which is that mm -hmm. it's really, really difficult to actually estimate engineering tasks accurately. Yep. has been my experience. But Extreme Gorhos in this one kind of flips that on its head and says that the timeline is the most critical thing. Everything else moves around that, which I think there's some, a little bit of wisdom in that. It reminds me back of when I was working for an agency where we would do fixed price bidding for certain jobs and you had to get it in before the end of the timeline. There was no other option. And it did result in some things shipping that were maybe a little crustier than we would have liked in the code base, but the client was actually getting exactly what they expected. Yep. And it ended up being an awesome way to run a business because everybody was happy. And then what we would do is we would just dog year stuff that we felt needed to be cleaned up whenever we did like a second phase with that client. And they were always happy to do it. Yep. Yep. People rise to meet expectations and it takes a really delicate balance. But when you give them pretty heavy expectations, they'll rise to meet that. And the really exciting thing is over time, if you repeatedly give them pretty high expectations, they will fundamentally change their processes at the team level and their talents and their approaches at the individual level to meet those expectations. And I think that's super strong. I've seen that work really well with middle to upper managers at companies I've worked at. I call it, I have a slightly more colorful way of saying it, but I'll say it nicer to keep this podcast PG-13. I call it the screw you do better effect. Yeah, right. <laughs> yep. yep, you need a client setting a deadline or you need management or you need somebody to tell you at the right moment, in the right way, at the right time, screw you, do better. I've yeah. seen so many teams that were just so sclerotic, and then somebody came in and said that in the right way, in the right place, and it just totally turns the team around. I think the key there, though, is that they need to have resources to be able to do better. Sometimes people just ask you to do better, but there's no resources in order for you to do that, and that's like a yeah. no-win scenario. But if you have both, I think that there's some there's some wisdom in that approach. Yeah, I'm It's gonna, a little harsh, but there's wisdom in it at times. I'm going to get us sidetracked again with a little bit of an anecdote, but I'll try and keep it tight, is uh, at Cruise Automation, one of my past jobs, 
we were producing labeled images for autonomous vehicle machine learning systems. So this is training data to feed into computer vision. And we were moving super slowly. I had this huge project that took like a quarter and a half where I identified a really manual step in that process that totally sucked. I spent so much political capital as a product manager getting that across the finish line. And then the team that was supposed to use it didn't use it because it required too much of a process shift and paradigm change on their part. And then I burned all my political will. I was like persona non grata for a while after that because like, hey, dude, we put all this engineering into this product and the customer won't use it. And then like a month later, I had the perfect deus ex machina. This upper manager came in, audited us, and it's like, guys, I have some background at Waymo. They were running 10 times as fast at this part of the process. I want you to be 10 times as fast. Everybody panicked and like, oh my God, how do they, how do we do that? And they're like, wait, this tool Casey built makes us 10 times as fast. <laughs> it's amazing so, how that works sometimes. Yep. So you could identify the problem and you can build the perfect solution to the problem, but you're not going to get there without somebody saying, screw you, do better. Yep. Yep. All right, number 10, there is no refactoring, just rework. If things ever go wrong, just use Extreme Go Horse to quickly solve the problem. Whenever the problem requires rewriting the whole software, it's time for you to drop off before the whole thing goes down. <laughs> so do you want to tell me, have you ever seen a rewrite in prod that actually worked out? You know, to be honest, I haven't seen that many rewrites. I feel like the companies I've been at have been shockingly good at being like, nah, screw that, we're not rewriting this. So I've seen a couple of rewrites and every single one has been a colossal failure. Yeah. I've heard of one that worked out, but in that case, the one that worked out, it was kind of like a rewrite while it was in flight, as opposed to just like, okay, we're gonna start the whole repo from scratch and rewrite. It wasn't like a from scratch rewrite. It was like a, all of our existing stuff is going to be considered legacy and we're just going to start building like a sidecar pattern and then kind of migrate over as we go. Um, yeah. I wasn't around for that. I just heard about that and heard that it worked, but I've never heard of like a full blown rewrite actually yeah. working. Is this successful rewrite in the room with us right now, Luke? <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, no, no. It was uh, my manager at Tonal, Max, the company they worked at for previously, they had, they had to migrate state management systems and when they did it i believe they also did a full rewrite and so that's i can't remember which company that was but that's my understanding yeah so this one's tough i think reworks are pretty fraught too honestly there's some degree of you just have to live with the system you have i, I was shocked at the at firebase the real-time database code was shockingly clean yeah it was a really impressive project so i think i've had the good fortune to mostly work with good systems and when I was at Cruise Automation, I was a product manager, so I didn't have to touch the code. Honestly, thank God. No offense to the guys I worked with. I think a lot of them were great dudes. but And then some of them weren't so great of dudes. But for the most part, everybody was awesome. But man, they were really fighting a bad system. And I don't know what to say when you're in that situation. It's so tempting to do an overhaul. But also that overhaul is probably just going to bite you. There's so much wisdom here. in the existing code base that is not documented. And once you start doing a rewrite, you lose all of that. And so there, there, it's very easy to kind of not appreciate what you have because you don't know 100% of what you have. Yep. Yep. All right. Let's move on to the next one. You'll like this one. Oh, definitely. Extreme Go Horse is anarchic. There's no need for a project manager. There's no owner and everyone does whatever they want when the problem and requirements appear. Big on this one, I mean, I'm a product manager, and they're super useful, important. Everybody's got to love the product manager, but those project guys, they suck. <laughs> oh, it does but, say project manager, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. You, you escape just by the skin of your teeth. I know, I know. I think I mean, they, that must be a translation. They must mean product manager in this case. I think they mean project. I mean, it depends on the company <laughs> what they mean. There's All project, right. there's product, there's yeah. program. At to be Cruise, fair, a lot was, of product managers are project managers. Yep. Yeah, my favorite was at Cruise, there was technical programs manager, and then there was technical product manager. And technical, by the way, was literally just a euphemism for internal instead of external facing. It had nothing to do with how technical huh, or not you were. Weird. And so 
you couldn't be TPM for both. So product managers that were technical were PMTs. And then the org was the paren T PM paren T org. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's a nightmare. But uh, on this one, yeah, like I've seen so many projects, sometimes product, sometimes program. They're so fuzzy. But anyway, there's a common role that people fill. Once again, this is somewhere where the language used in the industry tends to be a little more colorful. But there's the JIRA secretary. And mm. nobody ever wants to be the JIRA secretary. They want the other person to be the JIRA secretary. And if you're at the point where you have a JIRA secretary... I think something's gone pretty wrong. Mm -hmm. One thing I will say is that I believe Linear famously doesn't have PMs. Um, Interesting. They, I believe they are only engineering and design, maybe? We'd have to go check their blog to be sure. But Valve, have you seen the Valve handbook before? Are you familiar with this? Yep, yep, yep. But you please tell the audience. Yeah, so the Valve Handbook, everybody should go take a look at it. I don't know that there are strictly no PMs, but they do talk about this, the second half of this one, which is everyone does whatever they want when the problems and requirements appear. So one thing that's really critical to the Valve Handbook, which is really fascinating, is that nobody has like a set of priorities and nobody has like an assigned team or like project that they're working on. The idea that they work around is that... If something is important, then enough people will naturally find each other and be like, hey, this seems really important. Let's go fix it. And they just have authority to essentially just go fix it without having to ask for permission. Yep. Yep. It's Val's famous flat structure, though. Sadly, as time has gone on, people have really come to view that negatively. I think Valve's culture in part has just specifically soured to a point where that flat structure doesn't work super well. They're like infamously a toxic place to work now when if you talked a decade ago they were like the coolest best place to work all right you want to do 12 cool yep always believe in improvement promises putting to do comments in the code as a promise that code will be improved later helps the extreme go host developer they won't feel guilt for the crap code they did <laughs> surely there won't be any refactoring anyway yep i mean to do's are kind of a joke I don't know. I don't I don't have much more to say other than like to do's never get done. I've seen teams where they have almost like exploding to do's mm -hmm. where you either put a date on it or it's just built into the linter where when that to do is a certain amount old, you're not allowed to continue committing until you've resolved it, which is kind of a good way to do it, mm. except for the resolution to an expired to do is to delete the to do. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it forces you to at least clean them up. Yeah. My, I actually like to do's in solo projects, but not so much in team projects. The only time I've ever liked to do's in team projects is if you do to do and then you put somebody's name so that somebody has, there's like a clear owner for like who created yeah. that to do. And you can always get it through Git history, I know, but like it is nice to be able to just see it very clearly. Yeah. And then one other reason, I think another reason why that's good is it forces people to put less to do's in. like if you're signing your name on something, there's something about it that like stops people from just like scattering them all over the code yeah. base. Yeah. Most places I've worked have had a linter that requires names associated with to do's. Yeah. Um, cool. But I will say that I do like using to do's for um, avoiding, which one was it? I'm trying to remember. Being reactive. I can't remember. Oh, it's just the idea of, you know, you're going to work on something very specific. And if you see something else that you, that you want to address, you can use the to do so that you can get back to it later, as opposed to like trying to roll some unrelated fix in with the code that you're trying to ship. Yep, yep, that makes sense. And another way I think you could look at to do is it's not so much telling you you have to do this later. It's more explaining what needs to be done if you start hitting your head against that problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's almost like a comment 
that is flagged with the fact that it will might become a problem later. So yeah. under this model, it's totally fine to put a to-do that you're never intending to work on because the value of the to-do is not telling you you need to work on it. It's so when you do hit a problem, you now have a paper trail indicating to you, this is why I thought this would be a problem. And it's almost like the writer saying, if you're seeing this, it's because. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's. I think that's fair. All yeah. right, number fourteen. Extreme go horse is not a fad. Scrum, extreme programming, those are just trends. Extreme go horse developers don't follow temporary trends. Extreme go horse always was and always will be used by those who despise quality. <laughs> this one, they are clearly making a joke here at the end. Well, I mean, the whole thing is a joke, but I do think that it's interesting. This idea that you know, just shipping code that meets the needs of the project and is not over-engineered is timeless is like how I would steel man that. Yep, yep. Extreme Go Horse is kind of branding itself with a manifesto and buzzwords and things like that. But all that is just kind of to play up the bit. In reality, it's just trying to be descriptive about what actually happens in practice and works in practice in a lot of places. Whereas Scrum, I think, tends to be a lot more prescriptive but even then, it's like so vague and fuzzy. God knows what Scrum and Agile actually mean in practice. I'm going to get so many hate tweets about that because each person's like, no, 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 Scrum and Agile are well-defined. And they link to their like consultancy package du jour. Yeah, right. <laughs> yep. Cool. I think we've actually run through pretty much all of the Extreme Go Horse points that are core. I think the rest are kind of mostly just jokes. Do you see any that jump out to you? Let's do 21. Cool. Be used to the living on the edge feeling. This feels like an advertisement for Microsoft Edge computing. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, failure and success are really similar and Extreme Go Horse is no different. People normally think that a project can have greater chances of failing when using Extreme Go Horse. But success is just a way of seeing it. The project failed. You learned something with it. Then for you, it was a success. So I mean, this one's course, actually really funny because I actually had an instance at Tonal where... I executed on a project and it didn't go as well as I wanted to. And I called out explicitly in a one-on-one -on -one with my manager that, you know, this didn't go quite the way I wanted to. I thought it was an area for improvement. And then they were like, no, 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 you learned something. This is a positive. And I remember being like, wait, what? I'm like <laughs> literally sitting here telling you how I failed. And they just like completely flipped it on me. And so yeah. this one I thought was really funny because... There's definitely like a culture around this, especially in Silicon Valley, San Francisco startups, I think. Maybe in other places too, but that's where I've seen it mostly, where that's this joke at the end of this one is like a real thing. Yeah, and I think there's a culture that's related to this where you're almost more interested in the derivative rather than the immediate output. So I'm using a bit of a math metaphor there. So to explain, it's not so much how did we land this specific project? It's how good did we get at landing projects? Mm. And I've seen some really strong upper managers actually explicitly set KPIs in these terms. He's like, okay, cool. We have some like base level KPIs for did we do the crap we said we were going to do and did it meet the quality we expect? And then the real critical KPIs that he would hammer home every single time was how fast are we delivering at scale? And each quarter, I want to see us be faster at delivering. And that sounds like it's really putting pressure on you to not learn and to just avoid mistakes. But in practice, the only way you're going to be able to hit those ramping exponential targets, so really it's second derivative too, is by learning and just fundamentally changing your pr approaches. It's really similar to my screw you do better philosophy. Yeah, It's like in order to hit those targets, you need to be worrying less about do I fail or succeed today and more about do I explore the search space of process and solution and find the paradigm shifting 10x solutions in there. I remember when I started working at Tonal, I, I felt like every three months I had to completely retool how I was doing things to be able to like keep progressing and keeping up. And so I'm really resonating with what you're saying. Yep, yep. I think that just about wraps up Extreme Go Horse. I think 
it's a great counterpoint. It's both also just hilarious, <laughs> but it's a really good counterpoint to, I think, the buzzword soup you see a lot. And then I think especially junior devs are super attracted to the scrum, agile, clean architecture, clean code, buzzword soup. So it's fun to see somebody really poke fun at that. People want a prescription. I think that's what it is, is people early on, they want something prescribed to them that they can just use and follow. Like, hey, you've got some nails, here's this hammer, use this hammer. And what you find out is that in software engineering, it's just too complex a problem uh, for you to be able to rely on any one of these paradigms. And what yeah. you end up doing is you end up taking a little bit from this this paradigm, a little bit from this other paradigm, and mixing and mashing them together to fit like the needs of the org and the project and what you're doing. And when you're done doing that, you realize that you've been do doing something like Extreme Go Horse that whole time. All right, so we'll post the links in the show notes. Um, this is a fun one, Casey. Thanks for doing it with me. Yeah, yeah, a lot of fun. I think we had to do these more too. They're, it's fun to jump onto something topical that we both have strong opinions on. And please, uh, guys in the audience, please let us know what you think and feel free to tweet at us with what kind of topics you want to see us cover, especially if you see a YouTube video drop with something really topical.